Hello. In this video, we will cover section 6.3, which is on binomial distributions. The binomial distribution is used to model many discrete probability distributions. The classic example is modding, modeling the probability of coin flip results. Suppose you flip a coin 10 times and you want to know the probability of only getting one head or five heads. A similar example would be if we randomly select 10 people, what's the probability that we get one Republican or five Republicans? If we randomly select 10 students, what's the probability of getting one that's on the dean li dean's list or five that are on the dean's list? Binomial distributions can model each of these situations. To use the binomial distribution, the event or experiment has to meet the following requirements. There has to be a fixed number of trials. So for example, you flip a coin 10 times. There has to be only two possible outcomes, success or failure. With a coin flip, that would either be you get heads or you don't get heads. The probability of success must be the same for every trial. Right? So the coin has a 50% chance for heads on every single flip. And then the trials have to be independent. If a coin flip is heads, then that can't change the probability of getting heads on the next coin flip, or you can't use the binomial distribution. So let's look, let's look at some examples of things that do meet the requirements and go over why. So suppose you roll a dice 20 times, right, and you want to find the probability of rolling a 5 or a 6 on 7 of the 20 dice rolls. Does this meet the binomial distribution requirements? All right, well, first of all, fixed trials, there are 20 trials. All right, so we're going to roll the dice 20 times. There are only two outcomes. You either get a 5 or a 6, or you don't. Okay, so that does meet the outcomes requirement. The probability of success, the probability of getting a 5 or a 6 is one-third on every dice roll. That doesn't change as you roll the dice. Okay, so that does meet that requirement. And then independence requirement. If you roll the dice and you get an outcome, it doesn't change the, the probability for future dice rolls. The dice rolls are independent. Okay, so that's an example of something that does meet the requirements. Let's look at another one. So suppose we have Zener cards or Zener cards. I'm not sure exactly how to, how to pronounce that, but they're used to test whether people can read minds. Each card has one of five designs. In an experiment, the sender selects a card at random and thinks about the symbol on the card while the receiver guesses the symbol that's on the card. Suppose this is done 10 times and the receiver gets three correct. What's the probability of that happening randomly? So the sleep receiver is just guessing. They actually cannot read minds. All right, so what we want to do is we want, we're not trying to answer that right now. We're trying to get, trying to look at, does this meet the requirements? All right, so we're selecting 10 cards. So there's 10 trials that is fixed. Okay, so that does meet the fixed trials requirement. There's only two possible outcomes. The receiver either guesses the card correct or does not. Okay, so that meets that requirement. The probability of success, if you're just guessing, if there's five cards and you're and you're just guessing, then there's a one in five chance that you get the card on each guess. So that does meet the same probability of success with each trial. And then the trials are independent. If you guess one card correctly, it doesn't affect your chances of getting the next card correctly. What about some failures? All right, so what are examples of things that where you couldn't go through and use the bi binomial distribution? All right, so let's, let's look at this list of four things and, and discuss them. All right, so suppose we have, uh, we want to record the number of different eye colors in a group of 50 randomly selected people. You know, could we use the binomial distribution to model that? Or a married couple decides to have children until a girl is born or, they, or until they have five children. How many children will they have? Can you use a binomial distribution to answer that? What about the probability a flight arrives on time at O'Hare Airport in Chicago is 85%. How many flights arrive on time out of 300 in January? And then finally, a student guesses on a test that has 10 multiple choice questions and 10 true-false. How many questions is a student likely to get right? Could we use a binomial distribution on that? All right, so the answer to all of these is no, and what we want to do is we want to try and figure out why that is. All right, so the first one, record the number of different eye colors. So one of the things you could think about is there are more than two different eye colors. When it comes to the binomial distribution, if you're going to use it to model something, there has to be only two possible outcomes, and one is going to be success, and the other one could be failure. So if that were instead phrased such as, you know, find the number of brown-eyed colored people out of 50 randomly selected people, 
then that would be something where you could go through and use the binomial distribution. You'd have to find the probability that someone has brown eyes, uh, but that's something where you could go through and use it. Uh, what about a married couple decides to have children until a girl is born or until they have five children? How many children will they have? All right, well, one of the binomial distribution requirements is that the number of trials must be fixed. So if we were trying to model this situation, uh, sometimes you could have a girl on the first child and you'd only have one trial. Other times you wouldn't get a girl at all and you'd just have five boys. And so you'd have five, five trials. And so the number of trials is not consistent if you were to repeatedly do the experiment. Uh, and so that is, that is a requirement that the number of trials must be fixed every time you were to go through and like try and uh, redo the experiment. Uh, Okay, what about the next one? The probability of flight arrives on time at O'Hare Airport is in Chicago is 85%. How many flights arrive on time out of 300? This one's a little trickier. So the issue here is that the probability of success, which is, you know, arriving on time, um, out of 300 flights, the issue is that those are not independent. If you were to go through and have one flight be canceled, and let's say it was canceled due to bad weather, then that would affect the probability of the other flights being canceled. Okay, and so the independence requirement is one of those is one of those that does matter. You do have to check for that when it comes to using the binomial distribution. If your trials, if the things that you're checking on uh, are not independent, then you can't use the binomial distribution. And then finally, a student guesses on a test with 10 multiple choice and 10 true false. How many questions do they get right? Uh, the prob problem here is that there are two types of questions. And so the probability of success is not the same. So with multiple choice, just let's just say, I guess that there's four choices there. Um, your, your potential of getting the question right on a, on a random guess is one in four, whereas with a true false, it's one in two. And so you've got two different types of probability of success. And that's going to prevent you from going through and using the binomial distribution. All right, uh, so let's look at graphs. Uh, so binomial distributions are discrete probability distributions. And so that means that they can be viewed graphically. Uh, the graph shows all of the possible outcomes for the event or experiment, along with the probability of success for each. Uh, so there are two things that differentiate binomial distributions from each other. Those things are the number of trials and the probability of success. So if you flip a coin 10 times to find the number of heads, then n is going to be 10 for the number of trials, and the probability of getting a head is going to be 0.5, 50%. If you wanted to have more trials, then you would change n. So if we wanted to have 15 coin flips or seven coin flips, you would change n. And then if you wanted to go through and model situations with different numbers, different probabilities, you would change the probability. So if you wanted to have a, a, a dice roll, then the probability of success well, assuming it was like to roll one of the faces on the on the dice, like a six, uh, then it'd be one in six. Um, you know, so so that's the the probability of success. So those are the two things. Those are two things you can change, and if you change those, then you get different binomial distributions. Um, and so we can go through and look at them. All right. So uh, here's the first one. It is the graph of a binomial distribution where we have n equals three, so we have three trials. And we have uh, the probability of success is 0. 0.5. So this is like flipping a coin three times. All right. So uh, the number of successes is the number of heads. And so what the what this the way that we could go through and use this graph is it enables us to very quickly just identify probabilities. Right. So the probability that you get no heads, it, you know, is a little bit more than 10 uh, percent. The probability that you get one head is, you know, almost 40 percent. The probability that you get two heads is almost 40%, and the probability that you get three heads uh, out of three trials uh, is a little bit more than 10%. Okay, and so that's the, the benefit of going through and graphing the binomial distribution is allows us to see the different possible outcomes and the chance of success for each. Uh, so um, one piece of information, if the probability is 50%, then the graph is always going to be symmetric, no matter how many trials you have. If the probability is not 50%, then that graph is actually not symmetric for a relatively small number of trials. It's still close to symmetric, um, but it does have this tail. And so this effect happens as you move the probability away from 50% when the number of trials is low. 
However, if we go through and make the number of trials high enough, then even with a probability that is different from 50%, you do end up getting a symmetric uh, graph, a symmetric distribution uh, when it comes to the shape of the outcomes. Uh, so this is this one has a probability of 30% and has 100 trials, and you can see that it is perfectly symmetric. Okay, so let's talk about binomial probability not notation. So um, if you're going to go through and calculate a binomial probability, uh, the, the, the notation for a specific outcome to the distribution. So this is a specific outcome. This is not the whole entire distribution. So this is the whole distribution. But if we wanted to go through and model uh, what's the probability of 35 successes, just one, you know, one part of this graph, uh, then we have a notation for that. And that notation, we use a B for binomial. And then N is the number of trials. P is the probability. And then X is the number of successes uh, that we want to go through and and find the probability of. Uh, so for example, if we want to know the probability of getting four heads on 10 coin flips, the nota notation is, so we put 10 first for the number of trials, uh, and then the probability for a coin flip is going to be 0.5, and then the number of uh, successes that we want is four. And so we put the number of successes last. All right, uh, if 40% of the population are Republicans, and we wanted to find the probability of getting six Republicans when selecting 10 random people, the no notation would become, so we've got the number of trials, 10, the probability of success, 40% or 0.4, and then the number of uh, successes that we want, which is six, okay? And so that's how we go through and rep represent uh, probabilities uh, notationally. Uh, let's go through and use that to do a couple of homework examples. All right, so, so for each situation, identify the sample size, the probability of success, and the number of number of outcomes number of successes, uh, and then um, go ahead and state the result in the binomial distribution notation. All right, so in 2016, 15% of adults in a region smoked cigarettes. If 35 adults are randomly selected, what's the probability that 12 of them are smokers? And when you go through and, and write out your solution, you want to treat success is that the person is a smoker. Uh, in 2016, same thing, 15% of the adults are sm uh, smoke cigarettes. If 35 adults are chosen at random, what's the probability that exactly 32 are not smokers? Not. And then this time it wants us to go through and treat success is that the person is not a smoker. All right. So uh, how do we do that? So we got to read through this and we, we need to identify the number of trials, the probability of success, and the number of successes. Okay. So it's important to know what success is. Success as an adult is a smoker in this case. So if you read this carefully, 35 adults are chosen at random. That's the number of trials. Uh, and since success as a person is a smoker and 15% are smoke cigarettes, that means success is 15%. And then if success as an adult is a smoker and we want and we, we're trying to find the, the probability that we have 12 smokers, that means that the number of successes is 12. And so we get 35, number of trials, 15%, 12 successes. Uh, let's look at question B. Uh, so this time, uh, just th same thing, still 35 trials, 35 still the number of trials. This time we're treating success is that an adult is not a smoker. Uh, if 15% is the probability that a person is a smoker, then the probability that they're not a smoker is going to be the complement of that, or 85%. So you take 100%, you subtract that to find the complement. And then uh, if success is this person is not a smoker and we want 32 non-smokers, then 32 is going to be our number of successes. And so we can see we get that result. OK, uh, so let's talk about uh, center and spread of a binomial distribution. So you can actually look at means and standard deviations when it comes to binomial distributions. All right, so the graphs of binomial distributions are unimodal and symmetric. And that means the appropriate way to analyze this graph is using the mean and standard deviation, if we we're going to analyze it using the techniques from earlier in the course. The mean and standard deviation have the same meaning for binomial distributions as they did in early chapters. The mean is the center or balancing point of the distribution, and the standard deviation is the spread, or tells us how far values are typically from the mean. And so here we can see a picture of a binomial distribution. So we've got all the different possible outcomes and the probability of each one occurring. OK, that gives us a graph. And then we can go through and we can find the mean of that graph. And that means going to be right at this balancing point or at the, at the very center. OK. 
And in this case, it's uh, 7.5. So to interpret that, what that 7.5 is, is that these are all the different possible outcomes, um, you know, or the or number of successes. And so this, when you get the mean, that is the um, is the center is it's saying that the center is at 7.5 successes for this experiment. Okay, so um, the way you could think about this is that if we were to flip 15, if we were to flip a coin 15 times, the probability of success is 50%, then we would expect 7.5 heads, for example. If the distribution is slightly right skewed, as is the case when we have a probability that's different from 0.5, then that means that the, the mean is going to slide over slightly to the right in the in the direction of the tail. Okay, so that, that does match with the information we had from earlier in the course. All right, so the binomial distribution does have a finite number of outcomes. So we can go through and use the traditional formulas to calculate the mean and standard deviation. So you could break those out from earlier in the, earlier in the semester. However, there are shortcut formulas that we can use instead uh, and that we are going to use instead. Uh, so the mean can be calculated by just taking the just taking the number of trials and multiplying by the probability, so n times p. And the standard deviation uh, for the number of successes can be found by taking the square root of the number of trials times the probability times one minus the probability. So these are shortcut formulas that we can use. Uh, let's go through and look at some examples using the shortcut formulas. So find the mean and the standard deviation for a binomial distribution where n is 15 and p is 0.5. So just take n and multiply by p, and that gives us the number of expected successes. Uh, the standard deviation, uh, go ahead and fill those in. And what you end up getting is you end up getting 1.94. All right, so this gives us some information as far as how the, the, the distribution is shaped around 7.5. Okay, so 7.5 is at the center, and 1.94 is one standard deviation in each direction around the 7.5. All right, uh, find the mean and standard deviation for the binomial distribution with n equals 15 and p equals 0.3. So you multiply them out. So in this case, the number of successes, the center of the distribution is going to be at 4.5. And the standard deviation is going to be at 1.77. So if the probability goes down, then the center goes down. And then find the mean and standard deviation. I just noticed that these are the last three examples that, from the earlier slides. Um, and so we end up getting 100 times 30, 0.3 is 30, and we get 4.58. So this is going to be the center. If you have 100, um, 100 trials and the probability of success on each trial is 0.3, then, the, then we expect, we're going to expect 30 successes. And the distribution around those of the, you know, of the results is going to be 4.58 is going to be the standard deviation. So that tells us where you can use the empirical rule here. That's going to tell us where 68% of the data is going to lie. It's going to be 4.58 to the left of 30 and 4.58 to the right of 30. So you could add 4.58, add and subtract it to 30 to get where 68% of the data is going to be. All right, next thing we're going to talk about is expected value. The mean of a probability distribution is sometimes called the expected value. This is the name given to the output you expect if you were to perform the event or experiment many times. If you flip a coin 100 times, then you expect to get 50 heads. Okay, And so that is, that's one way we can interpret the mean. So that is the mean. So the expected value and the mean are the same. Okay, So that's kind of neat. Uh, so if we go through and find the mean of a binomial distribution, uh, then that's going to tell us what we would expect to, to get if we went through and were to perform the outcome um, uh, you know, many, many times. All right, so if you flip a coin 100 times, will you get exactly 50 heads every single time? The answer is no, right? So if we were to go through and flip a coin 100 times, we expect to get 50 heads if we did that a bunch of times. So if you went through, and so let me explain that. So if you flipped a coin 100 times, you're not going to get 50 heads. You're going to get some number of heads. The question is, if you went through and did that, if, did that as an experiment. So let's say you flip the coin 100 times, you get 48 heads. You flip the coin 100 times, you get 51 heads. You flip the coin 100 times, you, know, you get 50 heads. You flip the coin 100 times, you get 55 heads. You go through and you do that um, an infinite number of times, then you would expect that the average of all those, when you put them all together, is going to be 50 heads. All right now, as far as the distribution of those, 
of the outcomes that we get that are not 50. So we, I said 48 and then 51 and then 50 and then 55. If we were to look at how those are distributed, um, they're going to be distributed based upon the standard deviation. Uh, so if we go through and calculate the standard deviation for this problem, we get five. And what that tells us is that tells us that if we flip a coin a hundred times, we're likely to get we're likely the we're likely to get uh, between 45 and 55 heads, and the likelihood is going to be 68% because this is one standard deviation. Okay, so the, the expected value, uh, the, the mean we can interpret as the result that we would expect if we did an experiment an infinite number of times. And then as far as what the how the distribution would actually be shaped, if we really did it, we can use the standard deviation to interpret that. Uh, and by just taking that and adding and subtracting it. So you take the 50, subtract 5, you get 45. Take the 50, add 5, you get 55. And you're likely, you're 68% likely to get 40, between 45 and 55 on any given uh, coin, flipping a coin 100 times. All right, so how could we apply this? Let's look at an example. So suppose the NBA leader in free throws for the 2018 season was Stephen Curry. Um, well, not suppose. I think it actually was. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, so Curry made approximately 92% of his three throws, free, free throws that year. Uh, if Stephen Curry took 600 free throws, how many would we expect him to make, give or take how many? Okay, so now the idea is the 2018 season's already happened. He's buried 92% of his free throws. And then we take him to the gym and we make him shoot 600 free throws. What would we expect to be the outcome? All right, so what we can do is we can go through and calculate the mean. Uh, that's going to be the expected value if we were to go through and have Stephen Curry shoot 600 free throws and do it an infinite number of times. All right, now we don't have to have him do it an infinite number of times. The point is, is that you expect the result as if he, as, as if he did it an infinite number of times. Okay, and so to do that, we just take 600, multiply it by 0.92, and that's 552 free throws. So if he took 600 free throws, we would expect him to make 552. Now, if he actually did shoot 600 free throws, he's not going to get 552 every time. Sometimes he's going to get 550. Sometimes he's going to get 560. All right, there's going to be a range of outcomes. And so we can interpret the range of outcomes by finding the standard deviation. So the standard deviation in this case is 6.6453. If we go through and take that and add and subtract it from 552, then that's going to give us a reasonable range, a 68% you know, range for what the outcomes are likely to be. Okay. And so if you take 552, subtract 7, you get 545. And if you add 7, you get 559. And so the, uh, the way to interpret this is, is that most likely the, the result if he actually shot 600 free throws would be between 545 and 559. And if you want to get specific about it, uh, there's a 68% chance that his outcome would be in that range. Okay, uh, let's look at another one. Uh, the Pew Research Center says that 23% of people are news integrators. These are people who get their news both from traditional media and from the internet. Suppose we take a random sample of 100 people. How many would we expect to be integrators, give or take how many? Would it be a surprise if 34 people were integrators? Okay, well, we can go through and use the binomial distribution to model this. All right, uh, there is a fixed number of trials. The probability of success is 23% on every trial. The trials are independent, and there's only two possibilities, either success or failure. Okay, all right, and so once we've got that, once we know we, we can model this with the binomial distribution, we can go through and guess at what, at what we would expect by finding the mean using that mean formula. So if we do that, we get 23. So take 100, multiply it by the probability of success. So if we were to, to you know, choose 100 people and the probability of success, probability that someone is an integrator is 23%, then we would expect to get 23 integrators. Okay. Now, if we actually did it, we would not get 23 integrators every time. And so when it comes to interpreting the range of outcomes, we can go through and find the standard deviation to do that. So if we calculate the standard deviation, we get 4.2. And once you've got the standard deviation, you can add and subtract it from the mean, just like we did in earlier chapters. And that gives us a range in, of outcomes. All right. And so that range is going to be from 18.8 to 27.2. So there is, and so in one standard deviation, according to the empirical rule, contains 68%. So there's a 68% chance that we would get between 18.8 and 27.2 if we actually did the experiment, if we actually, you know picked 100 people and determined whether they were integrators. 
Uh, so 34 people is not in the 18.8 to 27.2 uh, range. And so because of that, because it's outside that range, it would be surprising if we got that many, um, that many in our sample, that are 100 person sample. OK, uh, that is the binomial distribution video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.